you know, I wanted to start, I mean, I've got a whole list of questions that I wanted to ask you. And I wanted to start off by saying, firstly, as an internet entrepreneur in Malaysia for the last 16 years, um, you know, I'm not sure how much you and the government is aware, but you know, it, Malaysia has a really thriving internet economy. There's something like 10 to 20,000 people now working in internet companies. Um, there's a thriving entrepreneurial scene. There's something like over 1,000 startups. There's probably more entrepreneurs in the internet ecosystem in Malaysia than any other country in Southeast Asia. Um, you now have Kazana, which just in, uh, announced 150 million plus US investment in an internet company. You have great avenues like Magic and Cradle and, and so on supporting the scene. And here's something interesting, that the last three largest exits of internet companies in Southeast Asia, two of them Malaysian born, bred and grown companies. So it's, it's pretty fair to say that Klang Valley is the Silicon Valley of the East. And I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, you know, uh, the whole entire revolution, if you like, mm. in Malaysia started um, way back. Uh, and I had a role in it because when I was Deputy Prime Minister in 2004, it was when I decided that uh, I should convince the government that uh, we need to introduce high-speed broadband in mm. this country. So I personally chaired this cabinet committee on high-speed broadband. And our target was to get high-speed broadband up to 50% penetration by the year 2010. We actually exceeded the target. Hmm. And I believe we are now about 70%. So that started the, um, you know, the whole revolution. Hmm. And uh, I believe we also have the ecosystem, as you mentioned. Hmm. And, 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 and one important factor, Patrick, is the the cost, the cost of doing business yep. in Malaysia yep. is very, very competitive, added with the richness in the lifestyle. I think the Klang Valley is more cosmopolitan than people realize, yep. and people actually like to live here. And of course, it will make it better in the years to come. Yeah, no, I mean, no doubt. I mean, we, <clears throat> I mean, we probably employ just under 2,000 people in the internet economy in Malaysia, and about 100 of them are expatriates that we brought in from overseas. And to your point, you know, it's, it's at the beginning when we say, hey, we'd like to move to Malaysia, usually the guy's always like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. And the wife is like, oh, where's Malaysia? You know, I don't want to go there. And then we, we usually fly them in. We say, just spend a weekend mm. in Malaysia. And usually at the end of the weekend, 99% mm. of the time they say, you know what, we would love to come to Malaysia. We'd love to join you guys. We'd love to be part of building a great business mm. here. So mm. to your point, there is a great benefit to being based in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so what I know that probably out of all the heads of state in Southeast Asia, you've probably visited Silicon Valley more, more than any other leaders. And, and I, I know you were there a couple months ago, and you've been a few times the last couple of years. I, I'm envious. I've only been to Silicon Valley once in my life. So you've been there more than me. And just like, what, what, what's it like when you go there? What's the vibe? What's the energy? Like, what, do you, what are you seeing that you're finding interesting that we can bring back to Malaysia? You know, I, I like I like the the whole um, the whole mm -hmm. attitude, you know, about people in uh, working in the Silicon Valley. Um, the whole atmosphere there is is it's uh, very informal. Uh, you know, when I visited Mark Zuckerberg's mm -hmm. his office, uh, and you know, the whole so informal. I mean, it's like you know, it's not hierarchical. I mean, I'm so used to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the government set up, <laughs> yep. everything is kind of uh, uh, compartmentalized and, you know, you have very uh, different levels of hierarchy, mm. you know, sort, sort of thing. But when I went there, it's like, you know, you can work according to your pace and you have your laptop, you can munch your muffin at the same time <laughs> and your uh, coffee, your Starbucks coffee and, and, and churn out ideas. But they are productive, they are creative. Mm. It's a different world. It's a very exciting world. Incredibly. Mm. Was, um, was Mark wearing a hoodie when you uh, met him? It wasn't quite. A t-shirt and sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> so actually overdressed. <laughs> what, what was it like? What was, I, I've never met Mark and you know, he's created a, a, an amazing product. I mean, what was it like meeting Mark Zuckerberg? What were your thoughts? My initial reaction? Yeah. He didn't look very smart. <laughs> 
<laughs> but actually, he's very smart. <laughs> he's super smart, but he didn't look smart. Uh, uh, but when you get to talk to him, you know, his ideas, and you begin to realize that this guy is really, uh, you know, he's got it in him. Uh, and, and it wasn't surprising that he started this huge thing. Incredible, huh? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about e-commerce a little bit. Um, Malaysia is probably at the forefront of e-commerce in the region. Um, there was a statistic that came out the other day that something, something like two-thirds of Malaysian under 35 had bought something online, whereas something like only maybe 10% of Malaysians over 35 had bought something online. So there's a great opportunity there. So, so you know, I'm, I'm very curious, you know, for a man who's surrounded by hundreds of hundreds of people to do everything for you, have you ever bought anything online? Ooh. <laughs> Actually, I have bought... Uh, some songs online. Would you believe it? Are you serious? Yeah, iTunes on iTunes. Uh, you have an iTunes account? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm not going to tell what songs I bought. What <laughs> <laughs> uh, love, love songs? It's, 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 a, it's a collection of, you know, it's 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 amazing. As you get older, <laughs> mm. you you you're in this sort of uh, time where time has not moved on mm. in terms of your music taste. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have songs of the 70s <laughs> that I'm, I listen to really? uh, on a regular basis. But I also got a taste for some of the newer singers. Really? Like Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars. I like Bruno Mars. Very interesting. But of course, I like those people in between, like you yeah. know, Lionel Richie. Uh, he's, he's pretty new. Stevie Wonder, yeah. of course, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Motown. And I'm Motown. a great fan of Motown. I love Motown music. Really? Oh, I love the way they move. They've got, they got, they got rhythm. They really have. I like that. I like um, to see people with rhythm when they move, you know. Can we cue some Motown music? I'm going to have rhythm myself. <laughs> <laughs> Motown music. Is that, so, like, let's say you're in the morning, you wake up, you know you've got a stressful day ahead. What, yeah. like, what is the music or song that you put on that, like, gets you in the mood and gets you ready to go to cabinet and, like, kick? If I have a choice, you yeah. have Motown. Motown. And a fast Motown. Song. Really? Yeah. Beautiful. Love All that. right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I want to I um, go through a few scenarios with you, and, and you tell me what is the app or website that you would use in that scenario. For what? Okay. Let's say... Let's say you're in, a, you're in a presentation, but you're dying to know the score of a Manchester United football match. Oh, not last season, I was not. Yeah. <laughs> well, what would you, what, how would you find out the score of the game? Um, I'd probably go and, and, and Google um, yep. EPL. Yep. That gives me the score, or yep. live score. Really? Live okay. score, live score. Can, yes. OK. Nice. Yeah, so. Mm. I can keep track. I heard a little rumor that because you're such a hardcore Man U fan, Alex Ferguson actually gifted you the seat that he sits on in the dugout during the games, and that you actually have that seat somewhere. I have it. I have it. I will treasure that. <clears throat> so I, think I have it somewhere. <laughs> I know where it is. I think, I, think, I, think, I think the goal of everyone in this room is that 10 years from now when you're interviewed and someone goes, what is the greatest gift? that anyone has ever given you, you're going to say it used to be the Manchester United seat, but I was at this internet conference in Malaysia, and all the people in the room gave me a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, it will be listed as uh, top three. OK. Um, here's another scenario. You wake up in the morning, you play your Motown music, it just doesn't get you in the mood. So you know what? You're like, maybe I ate too much nasi lemak last night. I, I want to cancel cabinet today. Are you a uh, phone call kind of guy? Everyone does it. Everyone calls in sick. You a phone call kind of guy? You an SMS kind of guy? A WhatsApp kind of guy? Or, God forbid, are you a fax kind of guy? <laughs> um, I think I'd probably use the most in a practical way, which is to uh, call my chief of staff. <laughs> That's How he does it is his business. <laughs> and that's the quickest way for him to um, summon ministers or cancel cabinet meetings or whatever it is. I need that app. one point men. Chief of, yeah. Chief of staff, I need one of those. I need that and Motown music. Um, <laughs> let's, let's assume that you're in a meeting. I mean, I know you're never in a boring meeting, so let's hypothetically assume that you're in a boring meeting. And you know when sometimes people are 
or messaging or emails, are actually playing a game. Yes. What game would you be playing in a hypothetical boring meeting? <laughs> um, I'm into Hangman. <laughs> <laughs> I like to test myself. <laughs> 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 I, <laughs> I, 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 when I saw you walking into the Fat Boy Slim, you, you just struck me as a Candy Crush kind of guy. So, <laughs> so but hangman. What's the, um, what's, I mean, I, I, I know that you're a pretty, you're pretty active internet user. What's, what's the most recent app that you've downloaded onto your phone? Uh, probably because it's Ramadan. Mm. It's uh, connected with Ramadan. Okay. Just, just to make sure I don't miss Just to make sure you don't have time to eat. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so you and I um, actually share something in common. You have been in politics for 40 years of your life. I think you just celebrated a 40-year anniversary. All right. and, I've, and I've actually just been on this planet for 40 years of my life. <laughs> Something in common, yes. So that's, that's what we have in common. And um, so, you know, in, in my life, you know, I was raised in Southeast Asia, and I've seen, I said yesterday in my speech, you know, this part of the world has completely transformed. You know, you know what was a uh, third world backwater, is, you know, is, is now become a very serious player globally in many aspects. Um, I'm just very curious, sort of, how have things change in the political spectrum over the last four years? I mean, what's different? What is, what, I mean, how, how would you go about things, or how do you see, what lens do you use when you see the world? different from, say, when you first started your political career? It's, it's a lot uh, different, and I think this is because, um, w of course, the world has moved on, mm. and, and we're part of that. <clears throat> and also it's because of, uh, you know, Malaysia's success story. Mm. You know, we have educated more people, we've gone to universities, we've introduced uh, social media, we've uh, opened up uh, the society, Mm. So with it comes uh, a different set of challenges. Yeah. And it is definitely more challenging today to be a politician than, say, when I started 40 years ago. Yeah. 40 years ago, <laughs> it was simple. You know, um, you know, it was more politics of development. You know? mm. People want things. You know, people want electricity. People want roads. People want, uh, uh, you know, a, a public hall, that kind of thing. You know? mm. But today, they've moved on particularly in the urban areas. Urban areas, uh, people are much more uh, demanding and, and, and their level of expectations is much higher. Nice. <clears throat> um, so, I had, a, I had a really good look at you. You're, you're a very avid social media user and poster. Um, you have a full-time job running the country. I have a full-time job running internet businesses, and you post on social media more, more than I do. <laughs> um, and I'm amazed. And so what I did is I, I, myself, my team and I pulled out some of the interesting photos over your social media posts over the last couple of years. If you don't mind, I'd love to put them up on the screen and actually talk sure. about a few of those. Sure, sure. Right. <clears throat> let's, let's cue the first photo. OK. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> This looks like two guys about to hit the town and cause trouble. <laughs> um, so, I know you and Barack Obama are close friends, and um, for everyone else in the crowd, the, you know there's Air Force One, which is the, the official presidential airline, there's, there's actually a customized limousine that the President of America has driven in, and the nickname of the car, because it's just such a mean machine, the nickname is The Beast. And I read the other day that outside of his wife, there's only two people that Obama has ever taken for a drive in the beast. It's you and Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, <open. laughs> so tell me about that. What was, it, what was it like? You know, just two guys kicking back and uh, going for a cruise. Uh, to begin with, it's more comfortable than my proton. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you, 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 you can do a, 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 a four-man conference really? in the Beast. Mm. So you, know, you get, get uh, two other people sitting mm. across you, yep. and you can actually have an active discussion really? in the Beast. And you feel so secure, because you know it's bulletproof and probably uh, 
uh, against high explosives as mm. well, up to a certain level. And probably you can, you, you can move the seventh fleet from the, the beast, <laughs> if you like. But of course, I didn't see the whole, you know, mm -hmm. the comms communication system. I'm sure it's, uh, it's, mm. it's full of those stuff, you know, high-tech stuff. Beautiful. But a very, very lovely car. I wish I, I had one. I was, I was going to say, I was, <laughs> you, know, you, you can have any car in the country. I'm uh, sure you can have a, uh, a beast <laughs> in Malaysia. Um, did, did, uh, did Obama let you drive? <laughs> you wouldn't risk it. Did he, uh, <laughs> did he let you put on your Motown music? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> we didn't talk about uh, you know, uh, social stuff. That's when we decided we should meet up in Hawaii for a round of golf. Oh, beautiful. It wasn't a beast. No beast, no yeah. beast allowed. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, cue the next photo. That's obviously not the chair that Alex Ferguson gave you, right? <laughs> Tell me about this. Yes, this is the, um, the E. Usawan thing, you know, mm. the young entrepreneurs, uh, uh, and, and they were part of uh, MDAC yep. scheme. Uh, and, and it's a great thing. I'm, yep. I'm very excited about uh, E. Risky and E. Usawan. Yep. And I'm told there's some spectacular <laughs> Success stories. It's know. incredible. Um, I mean, you and I, we, we, we were very fortunate that MDEC set up a little briefing before this with sort of, you know, their top 10 young entrepreneurs that they're supporting. Um, some of them are in the room, but um, what, what did you think? What did you think of what you heard this morning? Well, I think these people are, uh, you know, have great potential. Mm -hmm. And because of the ecosystem uh, through MDEC and through, you know, some of the startup support that we're given, uh, I, think, I think the sky is the limit. Yep. And I'm excited about it. I really want to push e risky and e Usawan. I want to push the young people into e-commerce. Mm. And I want them to really succeed. And I want them to be global champions. Beautiful. Uh, in, a, in, a, in the coming <clears throat> years. Beautiful. I, I've, I've, I have no doubt that, that in, in the years to come, there will be more and more Malaysian entrepreneurs be building great Malaysian businesses, great regional businesses, and great global businesses. Let me, let, let me tell you an uh, interesting <coughs> anecdote. I, um, during the Sarawak election campaign, mm. I went to this Kueh Lapis shop in Kuching, and on the wall, she posted pictures of her holidaying in California, <laughs> south of France. And, and she's able to do it, selling Kueh Lapis and doing e-commerce, online business. It's huge. And you imagine Kuala Lumpur, we can be that rich. <sighs> Must be pretty damn good Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, I am. I mean, I need to get this, this contact from you. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, that's just wonderful. Let's uh, cue the next photo. This is, I mean, this is, this is a, well, this is a sad, but also a great story. And, and you know, it's, um, it's a beautiful young boy who his wish was to have an audience with you. I know, I, I was very touched. And, you know, and, 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 and when I heard about how much he wanted, it's like you know, every hour he would ask his parents whether he could have a chance to meet with me. So I said, OK, I will do that. And the first suggestion was bring the boy to my hotel room. Mm. And I said, no, I'm going to his house. I want to see his actual condition, how he lives. It. Mm. And I went to his house. And his father works as a lorry driver. So in other words, it's part of the lower income group. Mm. But I was happy that I went there and I could, I could you know, um, grant his, his wish. Beautiful. And I think, uh, I think it, it's one of those things in politics, Patrick, mm. that quite often it's not a big policy decisions. It is moments like this yeah. that, that re remains in your heart it's incredible. for a long, long time. It's incredible. So this is one of the, <clears throat> you know, I really will remember this occasion for a long, long time. Beautiful. Um, cue the next pick. This one is just to give the audience some background. This is um, MH17. It was, it was a tragic disaster. Um, a Malaysian Airlines flight on the way to Amsterdam was allegedly shot down by Ukrainian separatist rebels. And I remember it was quite traumatic for the families because it was, it was almost impossible to get access to the bodies, the wreckage, and more importantly, the black box, because you had Russia, which had their own position on the matter. You had Ukraine, who had their own position, because everything was in this contested zone. And, and you know, it's, 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 it's fascinating 
what happened. It's, and I mean, I'd love for you to tell us more. I, I know you haven't revealed much on what happened and how you led the charge to actually get access to all of that, even though it was a hotly contested. So I'd, I'd love for you to tell us that story. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, as we all know, we were, we were caught up in this you know, geopolitical tension mm. in this part of the world. I mean, we were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. And when the plane was shot down, uh, you know, bodies were strewn, lying, rotting away. We didn't have the black box. We had, you know, grieving families. And the most poignant moment was when I met the families. I, I really felt for them, you know. I really felt that uh, they wanted me to do something. Because mm. then, then I, uh, not to mention, of course, my own uh, step-grandmother was on board. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a, a family tragedy as well. So I uh, uh, um, asked myself, what can I do you know, to really find a closure to the whole uh, tragic event? So that's when I decided that I should try to uh, activate you know, my international networking, the people I know. I asked myself, OK, he's, he's leader of the rebel. Uh, but there must be someone who knows him. So it was like uh, by trial and error, and, you know, called up a number of leaders, and, and eventually I found someone, <laughs> unfortunately wow. doesn't want to be disclosed, who knows this Barodai guy. <laughs> and, and he gave me Barodai's phone number. And I actually spoke to Barodai. You of spoke course, to the leader? I spoke to the leader. Of of the uh, of the uh, you know the the rubble. Wow, and of course he spoke <laughs> Russian, and there was a translator, and and he told me that yes, because you ask, because I believe in you, I will allow your people to come in, have access, and 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 I will hand over the black box to you, only to your people, not to the others. He said, not to the Russians, not to the Ukrainians, not 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 to the to to to. Uh, to the Ukrainians or to the others. But I had a very, very tough call to make, Patrick, because I would be sending Malaysian soldiers mm. into, into uh, you know, a conflict area. You know, there's always that risk that they, you know, they could be um, held as hostage or they could be shot. I mean, anything could have happened. But, you know, that's one of those... A life and death sort of situation where, as a head of government, you have to make that call. Uh, then I decided that I needed, I needed to send my people in, and I assured the leader, and I spoke to him personally. There's another interesting thing about this. I was directing the operation myself. I didn't go through the chain of command. I didn't go to the chief of armed forces mm -hmm. or the security council. I was speaking to the head of the, of the team, uh, a lieutenant colonel, Zakri. And I sent him in with a small team of half a dozen people. Uh, he was hesitant to begin with for obvious reasons because they were big, burly guys with mm. uh, Kalashnikov rifles and mm. machine guns, you know. Uh, and they were at every checkpoint. I mean, do, I mean, how how confident was he, you know, to go through safely? So I had to make that call, Patrick. And it was one of those that was very difficult. And I didn't sleep the whole night because. The operation was conducted uh, wow. at 3, 4 in the morning during fasting month as well. So uh, that's something that was uh, very, very um, uh, difficult and very challenging for me. But, that is, look, that, that's incredible, and I'm sure everyone's glad you did that. And you know what, one day when iFlix starts making original productions, we'd love to talk to you about making a story <laughs> about that. Um, <clears throat> so, I've been following the social media accounts lately of Barack Obama, David Cameron, Lee Sin Lung, and yourself. And you know what? If there was an award for the head of state who posts more photos of food than anyone else, you would be the global winner. <laughs> Can we cue the next photo? Um, this is what you posted this morning. Can we cue the next photo? This is what you posted this morning as well. Can we, can we cue the next photo? And the next one? And the next one? This is all from this morning, by the way. And the next one? 
<laughs> and next one. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> this is probably the worst time of the month to be torturing me with uh, food photos. But um, you know, it's it's uh, it's fascinating because um, you know if you follow any other head of state, it's always very official, serious stuff, which is great. But you're obsessed with food. <laughs> That's a Malaysian hobby. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we love our food, uh, you know, for obvious reason, and I think this must be the culinary center in the world. No doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> there's, um, I don't know if you knew this, but in the internet economy, you know, we're talking about how things have changed. There's now people in the world whose full-time career is posting photos of food. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I was going to say, if one day in retirement and golf is not your thing, you could, you could, you could definitely be a great food blogger. Um, <clears throat> So, I got, I've, got, I've got one, I've got a few last questions for you. You ready for it? <laughs> Depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's not about food. Uh, I was on stage yesterday and, okay, let me go back a sec. I remember reading an interview of Barack Obama who said that he has probably a three to five man team that manages his social media accounts. And someone actually asked him and said, do you actually know how to post on Twitter yourself? And he actually admitted that he doesn't. Ooh. <laughs> so I wanted, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have a team that helps you, but I, you know, you know, you've obviously bought Motown music on iTunes and you've bought Quayla Piss online. Do you actually know how to post on social media yourself? Actually, I do. I do. And I've uh, tweeted myself yep. uh, quite a number of times. But I do have a team to back me. So actually, there are three types of tweets, to be honest with you. One, I tweet myself. Number two, they tweet for me. Uh, they could be the, the normal uh, <coughs> run-of-the-mill kind of mm. stuff. You know? uh, the third would be, I would tell them, this is what I'd like. But because I'm on the move, yep. because I'm, uh, you know, just coming out of a long house or somewhere, uh, they'll do it for me, you know. But it is my content, so so we have different. So it's as good as me. I'm doing it myself, but because for practical reason, you know, I have to shake hands with so many people. I couldn't mm. just hide in a corner and then. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I need a Swedish thing, you know. <laughs> so. So if, so if I asked you to tweet now? I suppose I could. I can. <laughs> Might not work this morning. <laughs> you know, Murphy's Law. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was on stage yesterday and I told myself I wanted to take a selfie with the top four to five hundred internet leaders in Southeast Asia and I forgot. And now that I'm on stage here with you, if you're up for it, I would love to take a selfie with you, me, and everyone in this room, in the oh, background, okay. in one photo. Is everyone up for that? That's it. All right, let's do it. 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 Everyone is sitting there, stand. And um, the Prime Minister, you're going to love this because... Yes, iPhone in the, my jacket. Yeah. This is the other phone. <laughs> yeah, the other phone. <laughs> I can't get two phones there. <laughs> Should I get the right phone? I'm, I'm going to do a favor for you. So when, when you tweet about someone and you put their name in the tweet, they get some of your followers and vice versa. So, so if you could be so kind to put my name in the tweet. But you know, it works both ways because I'll tweet about you and put your name in my tweet. So we'll both get each other's followers. You have like, so you have like 3 million followers, I have 231. <laughs> so, so it sounds like a fair trade. So a selfie? Selfie. Yeah. All okay. right. That is selfie. So where do we stand? Let's, uh, let's, uh, where do you want me to stand here? Yeah? Let's, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it on the step and we'll get everyone back on. Everybody in. Yep, yeah. is everyone ready? Yeah. All right. All right. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. All right, well done. So yeah. Yeah.